Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Robinson. I'm Carson Gruba. We're living the line, and today we are joined by the birthday boy, Matt Pataglia. How you doing, Matt? Great, thanks. Uh, you know, no better way to celebrate my birthday than to talk comic books with you guys. So I hear that today is your big three, four birthday, that you uh-huh. have surpassed uh, Marilyn Monroe, Kurt Cobain, Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, and Jesus for eldest living cartoon enthusiast is that correct <laughs> yeah yeah it sounds sounds like it except uh, for um none of those have conspiracies that they're still alive are do they jesus i'm pretty sure jesus came back to life matt <laughs> I, I, yeah i think that depends on your, your definition to, uh, <laughs> I, I remember reading a few uh, new testament things that uh, maybe <laughs> convinced that that people were uh uh prophesying that things had maintained uh status quo uh in the in the death range um <laughs> we could chop all this out right <laughs> no we're we're going with the jesus talk for sure mm-hmm. this episode is about jesus yeah uh, well yeah in a way um uh in a way uh because so we're all gonna go jesus christ oh, why did yeah. they do that we, we are gonna be looking at something fairly spectacular today and um You know, this is a book that I have really lusted after in a certain kind of special way for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, Lone Wolf and Cub. Uh, When did you guys first encounter the Lone Wolf and his cub? Um, I I, I found it when I went through my first Frank Miller phase. And obviously, like, I, I saw the Frank Miller covers. And I think when I went to go read it, I was like this isn't what I was expecting. And I, I had like the first two omnibuses maybe, and then I put them down and then I, I didn't read them. Um, I don't know that I read it until like a few years ago and I've collected most of it, almost all of it since then. Okay. And how about you, Carson? Uh, I remember seeing it at San Diego comic con, probably those big thick ones with the Frank Miller covers. And it was like, Oh, what's that? That was probably 2000, 2001, but I didn't buy them because they were so big. And I, I, I've I, only ever read a little bit of the first volume. And I was, I, I just know the reputation of it as influencing Frank Miller and being so important. And every time I've looked at it, I thought, well, this looks like shit. Uh, the art looks terrible. <laughs> and, you know, now seeing it compared to, the artist edition it's like oh well it's another one of those reproduction issue things where they've just butchered the art so bad that i've never given it a chance so <laughs> yeah it, it's an interesting thing um let's take two seconds carson if you'll back up your mic back up off your mic just a little bit am i louder uh, this time I can yeah that's good too. right there yeah okay um yeah uh so I first picked this up. Um, the first was the company who was putting them out initially, and they actually put them out as 48 page, uh, you know, perfect bound things with the spine and everything. And that's where these Miller covers came from because Miller did uh, the covers for the first, you know, 10 or 12 or whatever. And then I think Bill Sienkiewicz did a few covers. And, and then they've got um, Matt Wagner came in at some point. Right. Uh, and, uh, and the it was a larger format, so it was a little bit easier to see. But even at the time, I, I remember having a sort of, um, you know, feeling like, oh, there's something, there's something that's not quite right about this, you know, reproduction. And uh, yeah, being able to see the original art uh, or color reproductions of it in this gallery edition uh, that they put out is a very different experience. Um, for people who have not read Lone Wolf and Cub uh, or just sort of know it reputationally, uh, it was written by uh, Kazuo Kiyoke, uh Koike. I- I'm sorry, I apologize. I don't know how to pronounce his name. Um, who was, you know, wide ranging uh, writer who, uh, you know, hit upon, I think, a really strong concept here. Uh, this uh, gentleman who is a, the Shogun's executioner, uh, for political reasons, he's going to be killed. And then um, he makes the decision to actually, he doesn't make the decision himself. He asks his three year old son um, whether he should choose the road of, uh, you know, honor and kill himself when he's asked to, uh, or whether he should take revenge uh, for his uh, uh, his wife's killing on his enemies. 
and he puts this ball uh, on the ground and holds it in his hand and he takes a sword and drives it into the ground and he makes his little kid choose between these two things and Daigoro, his son, uh, reaches just for a second for the ball and then turns toward the sword and he's like, okay, <laughs> I, I <laughs> to always, kill everybody. <laughs> I always read that as like, he was going to go kill everybody, but the choice was for his son. Like his son was, he was going to either... If he picked the son, picked the ball, he was going to say, all right, we're going to, you're going to be, uh, you're, you're not going to make it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's how oh, I yeah. read it. Interesting. I, 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 I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, it, I'm, I'm going on long memories here, but my, 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 I, my, the way I thought is he was going to, he was going to suicide. He would kill both himself and his son, uh, as he was asked to do. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's an intense uh, scene, and I think that the friction of having this little kid riding on his back while he's doing all these, you know, intensely horrible things in the uh, uh, attempt at vengeance is probably the, you know, motif that keeps the whole thing going. Well, um, it's set its whole own genre because you have like other stories along that line. I mean, the Mandalorian. That new Star totally Wars show it. is very much so Lone Wolf and Cub. Yeah, it's totally straight out of there. Uh, there was a um, superhero version of it in, uh, I don't even remember the name of it. Fabian Nietzsche uh, wrote it. It uh -huh. was Bucky, uh, the, you know, what, anybody recall the name of that? No. <laughs> uh, uh, he did it Bucky. with the Wolverine with the, that old man Logan one that they spun off and they have him with a baby Hulk. Hmm. oh yeah that was the mark miller and yeah mcniven yeah yeah um it's just but you know what what's interesting is you don't even get that until like the second omnibus the way that's collected like you don't get any of the backstory until you've already read like 300 or maybe 500 pages of it right well the image itself is is powerful enough uh to persist through all that you know, and him pushing the baby carriage, uh, you mm -hmm. know, those, those are really good examples, I think, of that kind of writing where you're providing like a visual frame that carries through everything else. Like it's almost like all of the action can flow from that primary image without having to really write anything else. Like, you know, like some of the ep more episodic ones are basically like, okay, he's going to go visit somebody who's being abused, um, as a lady's patron and he's going to liberate her. And then mm -hmm. other times it's like, he's a drug runner, right? It's not like, <laughs> yeah, it's not like a directional story all the time. How, what, what percentage, Matt, would you say uh, the overall arc is actually attentive to the, you know, our overarching story? It's like 10 or 15. I, yeah, it's pretty low. Like I, I've been, I, I was thinking about it and I think towards the end, it gets way more like it gets tighter and tighter to what, you know the sort of the the broad story is but like through the first um you know like six omnibuses it's it's pretty there's not very much that that points to the like larger revenge tale like it's yeah. very much the adventure of the week type of thing but you see how he's building this arsenal of weapons that are and techniques and sort of it sketches out this world very like really well uh and you kind of have to view it as this tapestry together. Would you show us, uh, what maybe, maybe we could start to flip through, what, what does this uh, actually show in terms of the uh, original art? This, the gallery yeah. edition, um, I don't know if you want to start flipping through, but I also pulled yeah. out so people can get a size comparison. You know, this is the <laughs> omnibus size. This is the like Dark Horse's, you know, I don't know, manga size, which you can see is even smaller than that. Um, this is the movies. <laughs> <Just> for, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Box set. Yeah. Just a DVD size. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it, it's a, I think he's drawing it and I'll go get, let me grab a ruler. And the, I'll, while, while Matt's doing that, I'll say the other thing that turned me off besides the poor reproduction was it, it just seemed like, yeah, uh, Adventure of the Week stories. And because I was trying to read like a whole chunk of them all at once, right. I think I, I thought, well, this book's going nowhere and I got yeah. rid of it. And I've, it, I've since revised my approach to that is like, okay, you read one story a day at in. most. Yeah. yeah, right. 
the omnibus it's, suggests read it all at once and that's a bad approach no, no I, I, that's, it's really bad approach i think it's totally overwhelming uh to to try to take it in it's a not that dissimilar to sort of mainlining you know uh american superhero comics or something and reading 50 issues of iron man in a weekend yeah yeah <laughs> it's too much so, information yeah so the um one one comment i will have about this gallery edition um is that the way that they've decided to do it um you you get the original art on one side and then like I don't know, for readability's sake, they put the translated one over here. Weird. Which is, it, so half the book in, in essence is kind of wasted. Yeah, um, man. And they're what were they themselves thinking? under the bus. <laughs> they're like, yeah. look how shit of a job we did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yards what, like four, 14 by nine and, nine and a half? It's smaller. So I, I don't know if that's actually the original art size. I don't know if it says anywhere that it's actually 100% uh, size. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some minor amount of or, uh, reduction there. Um, and Matt, and how much just, did you get this for? The images this in is... this books, book are reproduced at a one-to-one -one ratio from okay. full color scans. So oh, there we go. Okay. It makes sense though, because I don't think he had, I mean, I, I don't, based on the look of it, I'm like, it doesn't, I don't think he had an assistant or anything. Right. That's one of the things I want to, yeah, uh, we should, we should talk about as we get, uh, as we get through this. Uh, so, so this, but is represented by a fairly late in the series, right? Yeah, this is, I mean, the first page is from chapter 106, which is, I mean, in 106. Yeah, which I think is uh, it's probably volume like 21 of okay. this size hmm. edition. Gotcha. So that's where it starts. And then the bulk of the pages are from the final. I mean, the bulk of the pages is the entire final chapter is reproduced, which I, again, like it's it, makes sense because it's an easy i would assume they obviously had all the pages complete um, there's one that's from a photostat but um okay. uh it to me the selection is is isn't is sort of seems to be pretty random and there's a lot of like stuff from earlier volumes that you kind of were like well i wish that i saw like some more um of the action scenes honestly um would be more interesting to have seen but um so the curation is kind of whatever but it's interesting just because you don't see original like manga art ever yeah do yeah, they talk about where they got them from because they don't typically as far as i can tell they keep all of their art in japan so it would be strange to me that they're like having to cobble this together from collectors no i don't think that that's the case at all i think that this i as far as I know, the the um, somebody's estate or publishing company has the majority of the artwork. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, it doesn't, they have a, it doesn't say where it's from. Yeah. Mm. So so one of the things let's 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 flip through as we're as we're as we're talking here. But uh, mm -hmm. you know, you get an impression of how gorgeous the the brushwork is, um, which is not necessarily an impression you get from looking at the printed uh, page. Yeah. Uh, what, you get one a of the, lot of fill on the print. Well, know? yeah, and and this is a series where uh, it's kind of notorious for how bad the reproduction is, uh, and it people are more public about it than you might uh, expect uh, because of, because there was a lot of interviews at the time with the people at first. Um, man, that's a gorgeous page. That's right? totally disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> this is one of these. This is one of those pages that like, oh, I want more of these kinds of pages, not just because of the violence, but also like there's so much going on in here. Those, those single stroke uh, contours across the, the kimono there and that dry brush, man, that's just really. Here, let me pull out. I have this one and I have this, this in this volume. Let me pull that out. For us. It's the way he uses the dry brush 
uh, for like those speed lines in the background and so much of his rendering, like he's creating cross hatching with the dry brush technique and mm -hmm. hatching and cross hatching. And it's so beautiful when, when you're seeing those originals and it just translates like muck in the reproduction. Well, yeah. What I was going to say is that the, the only negative that exists for this book, at least according to the uh, first two of the people who licensed it initially for uh, publication in the United States is the size of that tiny book that Matt was holding. So, so, this, so is all... the, this is the, this is that page. Yeah, that's wild. No, wait, no, it's not. Sorry. Hold on. Yeah, no, it is. It is. Sorry. The flip is makes it confusing, but yeah, you can see how much it all fills. Um, yeah. I, so, so the negative, um, uh, so this, this art would have been shot twice. Uh, they, or I mean, maybe, maybe shot, shot once, but, uh, for the, for the, uh, monthly publication, uh, you know, they shot it and it would have been published comparatively larger, but then when they did those first initial small budget Japanese volumes, they either reduced it photographically from the original negative or whatever they did, they reshot it. And they kept only the small negatives. So every printing that you see, no matter what the size is, is is blown up from that small photo negative. Um, if you guys are following what I'm saying, yeah, yeah. And it sounds like that that small negative was produced by referencing the original large negative rather than right. the art. So it's like exactly. doubly degraded, right? And and photographic, yeah. uh, you know, reduction and you know the photographic process at the time already has a tendency to have fill in of detail and things like that. Um, I mean, just look at the random way that the the black fills in on the left hand side version of it on the, like the eye patch, mm -hmm. and you yeah. can see how much texture and like modeling is there with the dry brush and the eye patch, and you know, dude is just doing it for himself. <laughs> <laughs> no know? one sees it. Well, right. and then it's, some of these places though, I want like you know where I do feel like their reduction in some ways kind of tighten some of it up like some of this dry brush is sort of i feel like he meant for it to read as black you know mm. like i don't know well, that he meant for it to fill like that much but um you know i think that that's sort of a meant to be a black with the you know lines coming out but and he's using know. washes too right yeah well, so it, the color washes are intended to be tone indications. So uh, this era of uh, manga page tone was not directly applied. We haven't hit any of those pages yet, have we? Uh, no. no, but here this there page has some tones. And I did scan this in on for us with the original to look at. We're with the printing version. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Um, so so uh, the art of this time, it was fairly unusual to put tone directly on the page. And instead, they would have used like a wash or a blue line indication. A wash. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this one is probably meant to reproduce, you know, half toned. Uh, oh, really? That's like unless, that's the indication you think it is? No, they the half tone that whole page. Uh -huh. uh, but a but a page that has like a, a a you know colored tone indication that was like somebody at the printer would put that in as tone. And so um, it's interesting, like you can restore, quote unquote, restore uh, art from this time period if you have the original art without having to muck with all the tone and everything like that. You can just retone it using the guides uh, that are still on there. How yeah, are so they that's getting just half toned? Yeah. How are they getting rid of the wash in the photographic negative to replace it with uh, a dot tone? Well, that's not on on that page. You just half tone the whole page. Uh, so. The, the the case of when you'd actually replace it with uh, with you know mechanical tone would be if it was in a colored indication so then you can get rid of that photographically okay uh, using lenses so for instance if you did all of your wash with the red then you'd use a red filter on your camera and it drops out that and you just use that at the printer as a gotcha. way to cut cut the tone there are a couple of the pages matt scanned that have that on them i think that's a badass yeah, we didn't page. do color one soon but i mean these pages are beautiful with all the with the especially these snow pages with the you know little white out snow and everything yeah i'm like totally lost and 
so yeah so and with all all the wash like a lot of that dry brush stuff i i think it should be intended to represent as some grays rather than coming to this clump of black i would think so here's one that where that i, I don't know if this is intended yeah i'd have to see see let's, it a little closer up the um matt's got a scan of that one i okay, do great. Well, yeah, well, well once we're done flipping we'll through do the that book, at the end we'll, yeah yeah um but it's 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 not it's not um hold on i'm pulling it open just so I show you but it's not um but it looks like there's wash all over that page mm -hmm. so it'd be strange to but, just have that one just be like the and then one dot pattern right it's rep one. reproduced as a as the wash i mean it's okay gotcha it's not it doesn't look good <laughs> <laughs> like it looks like it's got a moray pattern or something yeah. like you can you they... can you can see it in the camera that's not just the camera yeah yeah gotcha so fiddled with the scale you, why do you think tone? he did it with the color tones is that just because that's he, for the heck of it yeah i don't know um it, it, if it wasn't intended to be a photographic or non-photo indication uh i i really don't know uh although you know sometimes uh magazine inserts would have been done in two color and mm -hmm. so um it's also possible that this was um you know some attempt at like a two color maybe it was an insert in the magazine that month um we've talked about that a few times when we we're looking at you know manga like berserk or something where they would be popular for one month they would be given the color slot uh, and then their work would be color just for that month, but then none of the reprints necessarily put those pages back in color. That page with the trees was gorgeous. Yeah, it sure was. All of the the natural stuff, you you get a real, and you know, obviously a, a debt owed to uh, traditional sume a uh, painting there, but I think a a realism that's. Uh, you know more realistic yeah it's a beautiful like the settings and things that he does are beautiful i also love how in, in a lot of these scenes where like especially like honestly when you do read it like reduced this reads is like like there's a lot more drawing than there actually is like yeah. I, I feel like that's something that i've noticed in flipping through this again is that like a lot of he 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 roughs out a lot of things and it's not um there's a page that's coming up here that i think is really where where it's almost like gestural and uh and i really like that quality well you, you, you can see his drawing process is including his ink uh which you yeah. know if you're producing as many pages as he was every month this is really important but like you know your stuff matt uh mm -hmm. we've kind of talked about this before like it seems like when you're hitting your stride uh, that you're doing a similar kind of thing where, you know, your your first pass with the brush is essentially like that last bit of blocking yeah. uh, in the drawing. And you, you can see uh, not so much on this page here, but you can see some of that, especially with the figural stuff uh, like that one, like two pages back uh, with those figures. Um, th this one here, you, you I almost feel like I can see the final drawing pass as those thick contours. Mm -hmm. And then you have almost like an application, like a tone application, <laughs> futsy layer after that, you know? Yeah. Well, and you can like, you can, you can almost see it in the, his line that it's like, he's kind of fig working it out as he just, as he goes, like, cause there's, you know, just these little wobbles, like, oh, that's like a, like he's starting and stopping a few times, just figuring it out. But it makes well, for this... it makes for energetic store, like art like it it makes it, it the every page looks like there's some movement on it and this is what i'm so surprised that there's so little of at least in the manga that gets translated and brought to america i don't know about in japan but it seems like so much of the modern manga has lost all of that and it mm -hmm. goes for these very tight closed off crisp clean lines that like just completely gets rid of the entire tradition of the Japanese pen and ink art and the way their woodcuts look and stuff. 
and when you look at this or you look at like blade of the immortal which is obviously indebted to this it it looks like japanese art to me and mm -hmm. like i love that look so much when it's you see um when you see the early 60s gekiga uh historic work that is intended set in a historic location you get a lot more of that as a common kind of thing uh I, I think that the the setting makes it like the reference a little bit more important like maybe um you know the fact that it's set in an era where people would be drawing and writing with a brush as a normal time you know it's almost yeah. referencing the art of the era too but man like what a charming kid's face there uh that that bottom panel there i mean you just I, it's just it's really striking he actually can draw kids that look like kids <laughs> It's just tough. Take that, John Byrne. <laughs> <laughs> but I like how he, he, you know, one thing that you you sort of that you end up appreciating is he kind of he's using all sorts of random tools to get what is his look. Like he's he's not just using like Zipatone. He's also using washes and all sorts of other stuff. Like it seems like he kind of just goes with whatever he's you know whatever he's feeling for each page, and it's 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 nice. Which was probably another nightmare for early reproduction because you're like, well, right. I'm half toning this page and I'm right. like, you know, all line art on this page, and now I got to deal with zip tone and like, yeah, like you can see just between you know their crappy translated version on this side versus this. I mean, you lose so much of the texture in in this version compared to this one. You know, yeah, like good for you, Dark Horse, for like just putting that there and saying like. <laughs> this is what well, could be it's a weird thing i mean it puts them in a weird spot because uh you know they are making money selling these obviously people read them and and are happy to do it and what what are they you know what are they supposed to do are they supposed to tell the people they're licensing it from like these files that we've been printing from for the past 25 years are inadequate uh please give us original art scans of our thing so that we can uh spend tens of thousands of dollars uh restoring all of it so that we can put out this you know i mean yes. that's what I would do, but i'm insane right yeah uh, <laughs> yeah i mean i get to me, it though that's so gorgeous i mean i just can't even get over how gorgeous that is that monk uh, this is another example i feel like mm -hmm. i'm just peering right into his process here look at the look at the hard much harder uh lines on the monks uh you know the, the all of the out outdoor outside contour mm -hmm. also the wrinkles and everything and then you've got this textural applique afterwards yeah. it's still following the form uh and and that's all dry brush right matt i mean that's that looks all dry brush like a split I mean, brush dry yeah brush he, he's definitely got split. like a beat up brush that he's using for for this stuff because you can see you can kind of see how like the, the brush is probably like that that wide like you can kind of see where the uh each stroke the splits stroke is. are mm -hmm. yeah and i mean he's using it up here he might have a few of these brushes that are just kind of split up because he uses that texturing a, a lot for for all sorts of things that's just gorgeous absolutely gorgeous yeah it's and the compositions i mean always just absolutely stunning compositions like all three of those, the, mm -hmm. the chop up of negative and positive space, especially the one where he's about to hit the bell. Yeah. Like the layers of negative and positive space. All the, like every shape is active. There's no dead space anywhere. It, it's funny if you were to uh, look at uh, his, um, you know, Kojima's uh, like Wikipedia page or something like that, and you'd see that he debuted uh in 1967 and this is you know 1970 to 1973 or whatever and you think how did that is that possible well it's yeah. not possible um as, as people have recently uh reported for the first time in english uh i'm just going to go ahead and say it uh it, you know people always knew that uh gosaki uh, kojima had worked as an assistant quote-unquote assistant for sampai mm -hmm. shirato um who is a huge uh, figure in the Gekiga. Uh, he, Sampai Shirato, did um, late 50s and early 60s series that were incredibly influential. It's really unbelievable cartooning and a really interesting uh, look to all that stuff. But the thing is, is that uh, Kojima actually didn't just work as an assistant for him. He 
uh, penciled and did the finishes on top of uh, Sampai Shirado's penciling for years. Mm-hmm. Uh, so if you uh, go by in Japanese or Italian or French, the only language that, it, that it's available in, if you go get um, the Legend of Kamui, which um, Viz did something that is unrelated to that much, much later, it has the same title, um, mm-hmm. uh, you would see uh, Kojima's work on top of uh, Shirado's layouts. And so for years and years and years, Senpai Shirado was putting out stuff that was finished by uh, Kojima. So he, he was already an industry veteran uh, by the time that he, you know, debuted. Hmm. Uh, you know. I wanted to point out this page because I think this one's a nice, another thing where he's finding the line. You can see it a lot in here. Or he's just also like just kind of sketching in all this stuff. Like it's not you, you're like the the comparison between modern manga and what we get versus this. Like I feel like it's like the sort of like Akira won the battle, right? Like yeah, where everything's this sort of technical masterpiece. But you know, I like the life to this cartooning. So yeah, I mean that's I it's incredible drawing there just sitting on the sandbar there and yeah you're, and like you're right nothing in it like there's not like a lot there but it reads you can, you can see him mapping it out with the brush mm-hmm. as he's going across it and then that delicate uh dry brush in the background there <laughs> and then the sort of arbitrary way that it's reproducing uh yeah and less. your statement akira won the battle i think that's what i was lamenting earlier i mean as mm-hmm. as much as i love otomo's art and a lot of the art that comes after it like yeah that that like clean clean line stuff uh yeah it's disappointing that they lost that or that it's not running concurrently or at least that they're not i'm not as aware of it well and we're seeing it and i think we're seeing it in american comics the same sort of split like you know mainstream is very much like a chase after i don't know this that clean realism or something and they're they're losing the the brush cartoonism i think well i think it's coming back over here i mean you got like daniel warren johnson and james Mm -hmm. heron and like all of these guys who are really yeah going wild with their brushes and splattering and tones and he's a lot more reliant on uh nib but do you guys see any like ryuchi ikigami uh in this style here oh yeah yeah Yeah. for sure you know he's an interesting comparison because you know they these guys were contemporaries of each other but at least in the way he's represented in english it seems like ikigami is um you know the 80s artist and uh you know kojima is like the 70s artist you know Mm -hmm. uh well which is not to say that both of them didn't work during the other (laughs) dominant time period it's just the stuff that they know they've done that's more popular in english didn't they work with a common writer too yeah, well, um, on Samurai Executioner, wasn't that the same guy that was writing some of, or is it the same writer as this? It's the same writer as this, yeah. So uh, okay. Kazuo Koike uh, was the writer on Crying Freeman. That's the, that's the, yeah. um, oh, that's the common one. Okay. That's the commonality, yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, Koike wrote all types of stuff, like all types of stuff, uh, like, might get his Eisner uh, Lifetime Achievement Award revoked if people knew uh, type of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, even Crying Freeman is pretty... (laughs) pretty Oh, well, it it makes Crying Freeman look like, uh, you know, uh, My Neighbor Totoro. I mean, um, he he wrote a series (laughs) in the early 70s that was published in like a, you know, young men's comic that Mm. was essentially like a date rape how-to uh, where the Jesus. the main character is like charming and gives all of these uh long-winded explanations about um you know how he's going to do the thing that he's going to do which involves things like uh stranding somebody with um on skis without their ski poles uh and, <laughs> and such. keeping them warm in a cabin <laughs> uh, e- exactly <laughs> like no shit like not not no exaggeration it's Look totally heinous stuff um oh, you know he, he wrote he wrote 
lots of stuff. <laughs> I, I would say that Lone Wolf and Cub is a is a you know a remarkable achievement for for many reasons, and one of the reasons is because uh, you know he managed to keep some of that garbage out of here. <laughs> well, that's I mean we'll, we're going to talk about Hugo Pratt later, but it's the same 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 problem with a lot of European artists where like as long as they can keep their weird uh, horniness under control. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even, I don't, it's not, it's not the horniness to me. It's the whole, uh, you know, I, I suppose crying Freeman has its fair share of uh, integration of uh, sex and violence. I think that's the, you know, that's the problem. Well, but that you get that like in someone like a lot of Milo Monaro's stuff is pretty rapey. And then, yeah, and El, 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 I don't, I'm going to say his name wrong, but Luthier Serpierre, his mm. Druna stuff. I mean, amazing art, but it's just like monsters raping women all day. And stuff. <laughs> so, uh, so this one is probably here's another tones page. Yeah. So, so that's interesting. So, what, what's the indication on the bottom there? Is it indicating that's going to be reduced more than normal? Seventy five point nine percent. Yeah. It okay. So there you go. So for the magazine size, that's the that's the size for that particular page. Looks like it's normally sixty eight. And that's what it seems like. Yeah. And and so that was probably a two color insert. This is intended to be like a color guide for a two color insert or something. And then somebody has to make it work uh, in black and white for the collection. It, see, it'd be really nice to get like a nice actual like production of this book. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it sounds like uh, we'll look from the looks of it. It looks like they have the majority of the original art. So, I mean, there's no reason that somebody couldn't do it other than the massive amount of uh labor it would take and everything well i was telling um, carson like the this uh, like this volume if you look on ebay i like it's out of print so you can't actually like if you wanted to read lone wolf and cub in english you can't you can't get a complete you hmm. can't read the whole thing unless it, without spending like a lot of money on it now how much like, was I, that last one that you held this, up there this number 12 let me I'll look at, how, it was how um, much how much did you buy it for <laughs> um i bought it for 20 person i bought yeah. it at like a strip uh, like a um comic shop in a strip mall in in new jersey so it's but like the cover price i guess is what i'm asking the like cover back, price is like 20 dollars. 20 bucks yeah yeah so like they just didn't know the comic shop didn't know what you know or just was being nice or something but if you go and like look it up on like amazon they're uh they're i mean uh um, like omnibus 12 let's see amazon says 221 for the paperback hmm. 221 bucks for a 20 dollar book yeah yeah who, so, who knows if they st if they still have the license to that it'd be interesting to see um, yeah I mean, but it, it seems like a work that's deserving of a fresh edition i mean just from a drawing perspective man that just kills me i so rare to see somebody who can cartoon you know big burly guys uh doing violence among each other uh and you know kids engage in wholesome uh, burial activities <laughs> when they're having fun like it reads yeah. it's, it's uh I like how he draws their legs where they're like kind of the, that chubby like little kid leg which is I feel like a well-observed uh thing the yeah. kid cankle and the yeah. hands the little the little hands ready to burst little child assassins yeah so if you've never read this series before Daigoro is uh gets involved in some fairly uh as we, heinous shit as we say in the biz <laughs> and that's my biggest memory is like that that the, the, the kid is like complicit in it all and he's kind of a badass <laughs> my my memory of reading like the first i don't know probably half of the first omnibus yeah he helps out i i always assumed that um oh he actually speaks at some point that's very interesting um i'd always assumed that uh the main character is modeled visually on uh toshiro mifuni mm -hmm. uh, do you guys think that that's a I'm, plausible i'm pretty sure that's that's um like true okay because i think that they're um 
um in the um the movie that's who they wanted originally to cast for oh really yeah well it it it's not like he's going for a likeness the whole time but he's got you know uh do you do you know mifune uh carson no i'm a plead ignorance on all that <laughs> uh toshiro mifune was a was a fantastic actor probably my favorite actor of all time uh and he was in a bunch he was a sort of like you know working partner um with uh akira kurosawa, kurosawa. and um so kurosawa started writing films with mufune's face and acting in mind and okay. so they did a big s- string of movies uh including uh yujimbo uh which is uh, one of the greatest westerns of all time uh featuring no no uh no uh no west no wild well, west and um, it was which one of the man with no names was yojimbo Oh, um, I don't remember. I don't recall which which American movie uh, uh, well, it's unauthorizedly the, the, adapted Yojimbo. Well, it's the uh, all the the Clint Eastwood, the Sergio Leone ones were right. One of them was Yojimbo. I think the other one adapted Sanjuro. Right, and yeah, then and um, the good, the bad, of those, the other is own thing. Both of those are fantastic, and he's got these super extreme expressions because he's in in Yojimbo, and when he's playing that character, he'll be super controlled. But the man is just a wild man and his his range of facial expressions. You can just see why a cartoonist would be like, that is my man right there. You watch uh, Toshiro Mufuni in, in uh, Drunken Angel and uh, he's just like contorting himself. He'll just be totally composed and angelic and then I'll be like, you know, he just, his face is like, you know, you can imagine like somebody with like Jim Carrey's face, but the gravitas of, you know, <laughs> somebody who never did comedy like he's just like you know it's very interesting well i mean when you look at the drawing uh, you definitely go like that's a real person and i i, I like recognize the face like i've seen that actor right. before i just mm. don't know what it is but yeah so the bulk of the this book is this final chapter by the way and so gorgeous yeah. like right out the gate come on and that's got some red on it it looks like yeah yeah it's very soft it's nice that it's not over the top they're like you have a color chapter and he just like okay i'll just put a little bit (laughs) you know there's like restraint in all of this which i really it's a it's a weird balance between wild and restrained well it's it's only that opening page that opening page is in color and then i think there are a few more that are throughout here like he's not doing the blood already, you know. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows? Crazy. Maybe they just gave him the one page with the uh, two color, two color insert. Maybe it's attached to another signature or whatever. Uh, it's so interesting. This is the photo stat. So this is the photo stat that all these page that all the print editions must be based off of. They didn't. I was going to say the inks got way darker there for some reason. <laughs> yep. Yeah, somebody wanted that on their wall, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that one that one left the warehouse and then you can even see between this one and this one that it degrades <laughs> well, let's see what eye patch <laughs> that character and it it looks i mean it's terrible oh. look oh man you can't even like you can't tell that there's an he's it's just totally black over there right yeah yeah like even in this photo stat, you can see some some lines in here, and yeah. it, you can it, tell somebody their bodies. And this, they they all read as like almost as just black. I can hear somebody complaining mentally about the fact they probably already just shut it off anyway. But uh, I can hear somebody mentally complaining about the fact that we're talking about reproduction the whole time. But this is a, a interesting peek into you know his the artwork was motivated by. You know, he's doing a two color page because they gave him a two color page for the last chapter. Uh, you know, and then you the, have another. The mechanical concerns are part of the production of the artwork and therefore influence the final product um, in a way that I think is sort of under talked about, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't know that there's anything new to, there's nothing to, like, the story is the, like, you know where this is going when you pick it up you know where it's gonna go you, you know what i mean like it's 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 well worth reading and it's a good it's a i think it's a it's a valuable reading experience but it's also it takes forever to read because it's enormous um 
and it's it's tough to get a hold of and um they should reprint it and they should do a nicer job reprinting it look at this That's like this is also horses, man I love that. You, you, you're bringing notice to the pull in there, the camera move, mm -hmm. uh, Matt. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, and also like this, even like the rendering on this face looks different than before. Than before, like he's um, it, I don't know, you know, so it looks like cleaner or something. Like he's not doing the brush, the dry brush thing on there. What? Well, well, go back to that real quick. One thing that's really nice about that pull in is it's not just um. It's not just like, oh, let me take that drawing and blow it up. You see mm -hmm. how those lanterns get closer to the horse's face. So it's like mm -hmm. the like if you actually moved in and how the things would shrink in in your focal, like that's really smart and it accentuates the pulling quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like everything gets tighter. Yeah, it's it's always wild to see those photo derived. Um, moves like that that instantly communicate but are clearly not actually photo derived like the move is derived mentally from it uh -huh. but you know he's not referencing anything here unless he's got a toy horse sitting on his uh drawing yeah but also i feel like you pulled this like if you actually pulled the camera and i don't know that that's going to be in frame like yeah maybe so he's i i have another i had a thought too with these and i i noticed that when reading manga and i noticed it when reading european comics is they don't always follow to me, the idea of where action flows, basically, I always think of action as flowing, you know, for, for the regular reading experience, you know, left zigzagging back and you always want to end, like everything should push towards the next page. Um, and I think I, I, I'll, we'll come across a page where this happens, where the action flows back into the page, if that makes yeah. sense. It, it, it seems like he's fairly was too. Hmm? It seems like it, he's fairly aware of directionality. He uses the yeah. counter direction, uh, like in this case, we're we're using the direction solely to see who's the opposition. Like mm -hmm. you've got the opposing army, so you can tell at a glance who it is because we've got them in their own space. But it seems like he uses it sometimes to slow things down. And the way they have it, you can't tell if those pages are a spread or if they're on a flip. And that could change too. You know, if right. he's composing globally across two pages. Okay. Yeah, yeah because then it, it's... Uh... So, like, are these guys these guys is my question. No, they're 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 the same the same side is always represented facing the same direction. It looks like yeah, to me. I think so. So then, are these guys these guys? Mm -hmm. so yep. That's that's what confuses me because like this, if if he's if this is the opposite, I think in reading this is the opposition. These guys, so these guys are kind of looking the opposite direction of him, and if they're on the same, you know what I mean. So they do have the same little lantern things, yeah. So I, it does, sometimes the directions seem to... Is it the same lantern or do they have different lamp? Or you can't really tell. I, you can't really lantern. tell. They just, they have lanterns. Is there even an opposition or is he just out there by himself? Well, these circles? guys are in a whole different clothing. That's the easiest way to tell. Is he just encircled by one army, though? That could be the case, too, if it's just him versus the... I don't know. I've never read it, so I don't just know. Just him it's... versus the old, the um, Yagyu. Right. So he could... They could be just circled around him on all sides, same people. Mm -hmm. Man. Scan this one in. That's intense. Yeah, that's the... just wait till we look at that on the, on the screen. That's the intense... Uh, that's the Mifune... Uh, you know, thirty mile stare, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the 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 drained of life, uh, killing killing blade, you know, stare. Oh man, and that hand, that hand coming across, breaking the space. That's just really effective composition right there. I love this. It's like you can just in these little like shifts in the eyes you can see he's kind of like he's worn out you know like it's the first time that you kind of you see this out of him 
And it's just amazing. And I doubt that 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 doesn't really, you know, you you kind of lose that in the reproduction and probably, yeah. Yeah, all the rendering on it is just so it's all lost. expressive. It's beautiful. And that stuff in the background, that's all that dry brush, mm -hmm. like split mm -hmm. brush technique, too. That's cool right there, how the sword yeah. like swoops around. It's almost like a weird clock. Mm hmm. And, you know, obviously, like, Mignola takes a lot of this stuff, too, but, like, these cutaways to, he does a nice job of that throughout. Like, it's a soundtrack. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, you don't feel the need to have a bunch of, you know, bird sound effects <laughs> when you could just have birds, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, you don't have to say, uh, then next winter, and you can just show the geese taking off. That's a ferocious one at the bottom there. Oh, man. Oh, man. You can see how you lose everything in that place. Yeah, that's just... It's wild. It's strange that they got the highlight on the nose, which isn't really that exaggerated in the original. I guess that's like, just how they shot it. Like, it's like barely... someone went out of their way to make that show up. Because it's really value-wise, not that much different than the surround, but it, they make it look really light. They're like, mm, we need it to look like a nose, like edge <laughs> that out a little bit. We need you to tell whose face it is, kind of. Yeah. I should put in the normal caveats uh, that, you know, poor person who's operating the, the big old negative camera in 1972 uh -huh. or whatever. I'm not criticizing you. No. Uh, you did your best. <laughs> it's all the people that didn't gather the artwork and say okay it's time for a new fresh edition <laughs> you know yeah, and, and not criticizing it's... dark horse because that's what they were given right we're... yeah it, it's weird it's a weird thing but that you know you, you contrast this with film studios who know what they have or or music uh you know master tapes still in storage yeah. in like a cave in arizona or whatever uh just in case one day they get even better at digitizing stuff. You still got those mm -hmm. master tapes in a cave, right? Um, and and the, for the film industry, it's really paid dividends. You know, you get like, uh, you, you go and watch original series Star Trek and it's the looks so good because they shot it on 35 millimeter that you can see that the lion is chained to the ground. <laughs> it's supposed to be menacing, you know what I mean? Uh, but that's, it, uh, you wish that the, the equivalents in comic history were treated the same with the same kind of respect. This is just an unbelievable uh, accomplishment, like an inhuman drawing ability, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And to do so, I mean, it, I don't know how it's many weekly pages book. it is, but I mean, this was a, a weekly installments in this comic for a three and a half or four year period or whatever. Oh, wow. And he did it all himself, obviously, because it's like a really consistent hand throughout. Yeah, I, I, I go back and forth about that. So I, I, I don't know anything about his studio situation, but he had certainly had lots of experience working in studio situations. Yeah. You could conceive that you could get a dry brush guy <laughs> who <laughs> knows your desired technique. Mm hmm and would do what it is that you want with a little bit of pencil indications you think you yeah. think that like i just it just looks so much of just one hand that i i have a really i have a hard time even just the way that it's applied it feels like it was all part of his process yeah i'm not i'm not i'm not saying either way because i don't I, like i said i don't have any insider knowledge or anything but um yeah i can imagine that that temptation would be there, especially given how much volume we're talking about. But then he also does cleverly, like this is a super impactful page, but like you think about like how long this probably took to ink and it probably wasn't much time at all because I mean, there's not, there's not a whole heck of a lot of drawing in it. Right. Yeah, there's not a lot of backgrounds. 
Um, he's really you know, and it, it may be like look this is the final chapter so he he like went all in on this and some of the earlier but even in the earlier ones he very wisely deploys backgrounds like the, yeah he, he doesn't he, he shows you what you need to see like you know a little but in bit. some of that you might get some assistance you know but this at the very least so character focused yeah yeah at the very least, uh, somebody there to erase your pencils and, uh, yeah, you know, editor helping paste up the paste up the photostatted uh, text. Maybe someone <laughs> going to go and white out the occasional the little bits of dry brush that he doesn't want. Maybe that There's that a seems little like white out right here and here. Some white out there. That's a nice composition too for like the pushing down because it's such like a hole down the middle and you just feel that mm -hmm. press and that little bit of negative space below the old guy's ass just gets a little smaller and then you can see it actually getting bigger here like he's he's starting to win yeah. it and it gets bigger again there this uh, staring background thing is something that he deploys a lot i think it's a fantastic device um you know the it, sometimes it'll be the nobleman or the peasants or the rabble. You just got a big group of people, just... mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Man, that guy's holding on that sword for a minute. <laughs> Where did his sword go? Well, didn't he have a sword hanging off his ass a page back? Uh, there was there was like a tri go back a page. There was like a triangle, little piece of negative space. Yeah, where did his sword go? His hilt. I don't know continuity. That's what he needs an assistant for. Yeah. <laughs> that this is a speaking of Yujimbo, this is really, you know, characteristic of the last scene in Yujimbo where there's a, a a gunfight, you know, or no, is it the last scene in the in the other film? You said the name of it, Matt. Uh the other film. Sanjuro. That, yeah, Sanjuro, uh, where there's a duel where they're staring at each other for, you know, a good three minutes before they move. Uh, and then the final thing is like, you know, over in a second. And then there's like a 15 second spurt of blood, you know. This, um, the, it's like the Dragon Ball Z storytelling where there's four episodes leading up to the fight and the fight's like five minutes in an episode. Me and Sean this, were just talking about uh, <laughs> taking the Dan Severn versus um, Hoist Gracie. Gracie UFC five fight and turning it into like a, <laughs> a manga where like uh -huh. each each minute is like an issue <laughs> and you're just focusing on like the hand maneuvering of these uh -huh. two guys grappling. Uh, someone I mean, else, please go do that so I don't have to do it. That's basically what this is at this point, right? Like yeah, this final fantastic. issue is. Oh. Yeah, like that right there. That's like that would be a fantastic yep. page of a grappling manga where their hands mm -hmm. are just like battling for hand position or like his thumbs hooked in the glove and then unhooks. And yeah, it could be done totally. This comic proves it. And it's it's beautiful, it's compelling. You're like, yes. But I feel like this you earn this, like, like this is truly earned if you're a reader too, where you finally get to this and you've read. 3,000 pages of of this yeah, story. So spoilers, 3,000 pages went by before this part that we're looking at right now. So right. sorry, uh, I'll put that <laughs> in the description. <laughs> God damn, oh, that's, that's wild. A... Oh, that's oh, I the scanned one. this one. Up. Yeah, that's the one you scanned. That's a beautiful piece, yeah. Oh, man. And all that dry brush with the tone over it's such a nice look. Uh -huh. yeah. and this is also from a the the photo. This is from the photo stat too. Mm. This page. And that one has wash all over it. But you can see where like you I'm sure that this is all a lot more detailed than you see everything that from the previous. Yeah, it's just it gets so dark. And no dialogue in this. No, no. Yeah, well, what are you going to say? 
Yeah, and no, I'm that I'm it's a positive. That's a comment, yeah. positive comment. Yeah. Like, and I mean it would be like like the whole the sky is completely lost in 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 the reproduction too, which is you know, and I, I I don't know, I don't know how you how you tackle this because I do think it probably producing these in color looks I, I there's yeah. intention behind the color, you, you know. I think you'd have to, if you were going to do an ultimate edition, you know, you could do this as a two-tone, two-tone page mm -hmm. inserted. The stiffness, and, on the last page, the stiffness uh, that he falls over at is, yeah, it's, it's pretty intense because it's like he locked up so hard. You know, yeah. That he what do you guys, goes down like a board. What do you guys think about the, like, translating sound effects? Because I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't think that looks good. Yeah, well, it's it it it's it's weird. Uh, you know, I having having uh, just done the adaptation of uh, you know a book that has mega stylized sound effects, I just put little unobtrusive indication translations underneath because look at the look at the original. You're yeah. going to get somebody who's as good a letterer as that uh, working for the page rates that uh, no <laughs> publisher can pay. No, you're not. You're going to get somebody's terrible digital uh, sound effect. No offense to that person. Um, but, you know, no, it's it, it's I, I think it's a terrible idea uh, in, in that. In that <laughs> case, it's actually a bit of dialogue. So you do need a translation. But generally, I don't even think they need to be. I don't I don't think the woof, boom, shoop, shoop, shoop. I don't need I don't like the Japanese is so expressive, like. I get the sense and I don't when I read a comic book I don't sit there and like read the sound effects it's mm -hmm. just you kind of pick them up as the gestalt of the page and same with the ja I think the Japanese does it in a way that doesn't need to be translated that one like you would have to put like a little star with like papa or well, I guess this one's weird because you're right it is dialogue I didn't I forgot that it's not mm. a sound effect but it's it's um it's actually part of the art, which a lot of the other ones that you find aren't um, aren't always part of the art like that. Like they're well, and and like you that. know, Japanese like leave that alone. Like you don't need a right. translation to know that no. he's going ah. Like you can see his face, and you can give see me a little jagged. asterisk down here if you need to. <laughs> yeah. Like here, you could just say you know, Papa underneath the panel. Yeah, the graphic nature of the language enables you to like extend out that first thing to have it be like this poignant cry mm -hmm. you know matt uh, is there a bunch of white out around all the panel borders this yeah. one yeah the, all the panel borders are are uh, to control that wash yeah yeah it's I think like that's a white tape or something that's interesting no this is white out this is um it's like it so like cleanly applied right underneath the, the panel border over here you yeah. can see and then this is white out like he whited out inside of that lettering it looks, it looks like out. rolled on that white that's why i do my panel borders digitally yeah that one's better <laughs> oh, that's great it's really wild that's interesting that the, the, color. The, the kid grows up because of that low angle he gets bigger mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like in this moment he's having to become the adult right and that we're we're at dad eye view now which is on the ground yeah and this one so they're saying that the original lettering for this was done on an overlay yeah which that by the way if you do page. fully painted work always do it on an overlay yeah, because yeah. you never know. You might get, you know, a French adaptation of your of your graphic novel, and uh, you don't want them to have to uh, take all that out. Man, that's intense. And then he's got the white zips here. I like that old dude too. Just looking at that kid, like, yeah, what? <laughs> what are it's you wild how, about it, it? how intense that is without even having any. Oh, man, his acting is incredible. 
like the yeah. way that these the slight like that slight tilt on the head is just like yep and it's like what especially are you knowing what's do coming like it? you you know it, it it means something by the time you grow up i'll be dead anyways kid <laughs> like well oh no he's wait. gonna try he's just gonna wait, try Carson. okay oh man hold on the kid's a badass he's like yo i'm gonna pick up that sword though old man come on now, try it shrimp this is part of his baby cart was the right the, the the handles on the baby cart all turned to like into like spears basically <laughs> Oh damn! Okay, yeah. kid. I mean, oops, shoot. I like that he tried to get Dad's sword, and he was like, "Nah, his his like hand is clenched around it still." Yep. I mean, this is a again, it's a beautiful page. Right? So, you're you're right, Matt. It's strange that he kept flipping that angle because there's not opposing sides. There's just one crowd facing one way. Right, and it's, it just makes for it's huh. it's confusing, but I I, I I noticed that a lot in 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 manga and in you know a lot of European comics where it's like the direction of the the direction they don't doesn't seem to be taken into account as much. I think yeah. I think it's artist dependent. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've done some analysis of different pages where I just randomly did manipulations to them, and uh, you know it seems like a pretty personal thing. And yes, he's erasing the tones off of these pages. Mm -hmm. This is like uh, the Austin Powers scene where they roll over the guy with the with the big like cement. Yeah, smoother. It just it's just coming at him so slow. Just zzz, and the guy doesn't get out of the way. Oh man. Okay, we got some speed now. He's he's running yep. a little bit. Uh, yeah, like again, like I don't know, like I don't. Yeah, I, I read just... um, Holmberg's like um, translator without talent one, and he was discussing the 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 debate around like uh, you know do you, what. What do you do localizing sound effects yeah. as a translator? Like, what are you supposed? Like, what's the way to do it? And I, and, and I think and I fall I, on the uh, asterisk. Set. Yeah, and unless, unless you can reproduce something that is uh, as affecting and communicative as the original, I think that the, you know, trying to unobtrusively communicate is the way to go. That's just yeah. That's that's well, and they covered up the they right. cover up the spear point spear. And he made he specifically made room for the spear to break through. Right. Yeah. Oh man, that's just wrenching. We really are gonna have to put a warning on this. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, he uh, got him. The, the guy yeah. just stood there. You had well, like he, eight pages to move. Yeah, he deserved it. The guy knew he deserved yeah. it. He was waiting for it. God damn. He, I love that he's got the the crouch uh, with the open hands of mm -hmm. the, the parent or grandparent waiting for the hug, you know? Yeah. And he got him right in the dick. <laughs> and then oh hands. he does hug him yeah. yeah that's just unbelievable that's brutal and the and the hands in that gray morass there with the, mm -hmm. with the dry yeah. brush coming off god it's just gorgeous and there's this little like again like he does so much with these just uh, the little facial expressions that that are almost imperceptible but it it you know i'm a bit sad i know the ending now but now i gotta go read it but it doesn't really <laughs> i don't know that it matters because like i feel like it, it the the type of story that it is like you know that um you know that he's not coming out of this alive yeah you know that the guy he's going after is he's gonna get his at some point and uh i don't know like like i feel like the individual journey is a lot is it, you know it's it's what makes it an exciting read it, it's kind of like hug. if 
it, it's like if mm-hmm. something episodic like TJ Hooker um, yeah. also had a through line or Magnum PI uh, also had a through line where Magnum was like a drug runner who was going to get his comeuppance, you know, mm-hmm. like yeah. it, it's, it's, it, you got this episodic thing happening for the majority of the time, but then this other, you know, other overarching thing, but pulling him closer like that. I mean, it just, uh, and the tear out of the one good eye. It would have been funny if the other one was. <laughs> oh, all those tough guys are they're all moved. They're all moved because they drove this poor little kid to lose all of his innocence and have to commit murder. <laughs> it would have been great if there was one guy there that wasn't crying, though. <laughs> like just as the artist i would have left one guy that was like the sociopath yeah look at like, this yeah, panel, that was though. cool look at yeah. that and i think that the thing that i just appreciate so much is that it's not i mean the drawing that's here is amazing but he doesn't he never seems to have to do more than like i don't know he doesn't it doesn't feel like he ever needs to show off or anything like like it's a i don't know not when you draw that good. Waking up is showing off. Right? Like, man. Oh, and then you just get, is that the end? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <sighs> so, that's a hell of an end. And this thing is also out of print, this artist edition, because this is like four or five hundred bucks to get it now, right? Yeah, I mean the kayfabe guys kind of made sure that it's totally out of print. And <laughs> did they did they do a video on this? They then? did a video on it, and that's when I bought it like immediately after that video, which turned out to be a good idea because like I got it for for face, and it, it's insane that I'm talking about comic books like you're talking about like ticket prices for a concert or something like. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's a weird situation. Like it, you know, as print prices keep on creeping up. I mean, you know, it's, you can it, you can read you, them all if you have a Comicsology Unlimited. You can these are all part of the Unlimited. So like you can if you just want to read Lone Wolf and Cub, like you can read it digitally. Um, yeah, and and the way that it's presented in print is not necessarily that superior to the to the digital experience. Well, maybe. and considering how much shelf space it takes up to like. There are 12 of these volumes. Yeah. That's a lot of shelf space. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but people want those big, thick books. I mean, that's like... I mean, I, I do. <laughs> I, I like them. I, I prefer reading paper when I'm, you know, before bed, so... Yeah, if yeah. it's a, that poor reproduction, though, I don't think it's worth the shelf space. So, Matt, Matt you scanned a bunch of... Uh, I did. Just comparison <laughs> panels here. Yeah, and I also lined them up too. I thought if uh, so, you could even turn one layer off and one layer on. But oh, I just like moving them to the side so I could see them next to each other. Again, you can see the lettering thing here too, which I didn't notice before. But like the lettering that you know the translation put in kind of covers up the one sword, whereas yeah. the lettering original lettering didn't didn't do that. You can see the white out there. There's something about those cartoony sound effects with the clang. Yeah. Too, you know, as I'd, opposed I'd rather to not be able to read it. <laughs> right. Well, you sound up something onomatopoeic would be, a, you know, vastly superior in my estimation. But yeah. You could see the, how tough it is with the dry brush. Uh, you know, you get this sort of almost random fill in, but yeah, look at the, look at the stroke difference there. So, um, you can see the establishment of mm-hmm. it. In the in the dry brush heavy one, you can see the establishment of the figure with the, you know, what do you think he's using a, a reed pen there, Carson, or do you think he just had a, like a chart more charged up brush at the start? It's like brush. No, it's a pen. Look look at the look at the look at the line that has a gap in there. Um, right that here. looks like a reed pen. Yeah. Oh. There's a few more in the uh, in the in the center too, where his tied his kimono is tied. The, so you the think one thing that that's a reed pen, you think? Yeah, that's what it looks like to me. Because that's a little that's essentially the equivalent of a dry brush line with a reed pen. Uh, because the you're running out of ink in the center. Uh-huh. Unless it's like a switchback. 
He like yeah, he's got that on the on. on the left hand side too. The left that right mm-hmm. there, the little yep. bit there. Yeah, so he's got like some type of reed pen or some other you know fairly f- like flattish surface pen. You can see it in the corner turns too. Um, when uh, look at the let that line on the oh, the 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 uh, bicep line uh, mm-hmm. when he's turning the pen there, you can see it get square turned from squared off to thinner. Yeah. And, and I think just another thing that's always to me, like pen is it's darker, you know, mm-hmm. it just has that darker look like the brush will get like grayer. So this goes to like what we were talking about. I don't know which video will come out first, but we were talking about adjusting the Sienkiewicz page. Like if you were going to do a reprint of this, there's a lot to be gained from leaving these darker and these like the mid gray yeah. in terms of communicating form. Um, I think even if you did a, you know, if we did a quick adjustment to it, it would lo- like lose something of the character of the art if that all got like straight black. I'm just going to do a real quick crappy. Yeah, I don't know. It depends on how how sharp your uh, your your scan is and how much you know you're able to differentiate the the different strokes of the dry brush. I think you could get a very similar character in black. But I feel um, like that that just that looks better than the re- the <clears throat> reproduction. Yeah. Yeah, but there's something about the gray too that's like I, I don't know that that to me is a real debate. Like it, if I were having to make those decisions. Like, you know, say that this could be, they give you all the original scans and you can, you can do, you can do the new badass version. Like uh-huh. how, do, how do you treat a page like this? Yeah. Because ha- having that contour line with the gray, that's the same as this right. is, is it says something in like how light these all are. That's really a yeah. part of what makes that a beautiful image. I think you'd yeah. have to half tone a page like this. I think that that would be the smarter route or a panel like that, but you do it selectively and you do it, you know, with some intentionality. That's just, that's a, but you're, you're right. Like, I don't know how you, I mean, just to, to the undertaking alone would be probably more than you're going to copies and you're actually going to ever sell. Like, yeah, it'd be, it'd be interesting. Something like this, right? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, it depends, you know, if you could, you could persuade the rights holders that, uh, you know, they could use that too. Um, you know, they get, you're using a, making a new master, uh, master, uh, negative digital negative that can be used for local productions and such mm-hmm. as well. Um, yeah, it's really, uh, like if you, if you start darkening it up, like you just kind of get that same clumpy look. Yeah. So when, when I see it, like in its original form, I think, oh man, you got to preserve those grays to some extent. Cause that's a hell of a drawing. Right. And it, yeah, it is, it is very interesting and very instructive to see those value differences and be able to perceive the methods a little bit better. But yeah, I would bet money that that's a reed pen. And then that's all just, I love how he'll like, okay, instead of doing like here, he's doing cross hatching with the pen, but instead of sitting there and doing like tedious cross hatching, he just gets a brush that's kind of messed up, right. like yeah. chopped out bristles and he just lets the brush work for him. But uh, I got to steal that. So then he's, but can you pull that one up real quick again? His, his hands and stuff. Do you think that's brush or is that all still reed, reed pen the, with that lighter ink? Uh, the, the contour yeah uh, like that stuff right there yeah i mean that kind of looks i don't know that looks like a sp- exploratory marks with the with the pen yeah. yeah and then that dry brush he he really is just using that dry brush to to build up that um hair <laughs> on yeah. the arm come back and darken up some shadow along here right you're kind of off mic carson oh um, uh to come like darken up the arm there give it a shadow mm-hmm. it is strange right. though that it gets lighter uh and that uh, there's points where that seems intentional like he's intentionally 
make because all of this is all pin work too for sure but it's lighter but then like his like thumb holding the sword is is lighter too like i mean it, it barely reads or it, you know it's kind of a barely their line and that seems intentional like maybe he has purposely two jars of ink one that's watered down and because that 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 ex expresses right. the the finger popping out and coming mm -hmm. forward and that's why I'd be reluctant in something like this to make everything pure black because that there's a lot of well, communication of space there and the shine of the, the sword being like looking shiny because it's not so heavily mm -hmm. blacked out. Well, the fact uh, that he's got a wash on the background probably means that he thought this one was going to be half toned. Um, so, that's, yeah. Is it a wash? That's no, the, it's a it's a tone. Oh, it's, it's, it's a tone. Yeah. OK, well, yeah. interesting. I guess not. <laughs> yeah, you can see it's warped. I think that it's like warped a little bit up to the top left, like across yeah. from his eyes. It's warped right here time. too. Yeah, yeah. But there's a lot of stuff going on, like right here. These are pin lines too. May no, that's brush, but it's all lighter, so it looks mm -hmm. more interior. Um, and that seems so intentional to me. It's an interesting problem. So that's the print, and then the other one. Yeah, that love the the parallel hatching across the eye patch, and then you can see the dry brush. Mm -hmm. It's creating a little gradient effect in the original. Same thing with that background, the subverted background, and the mild amount of gradation happening there. Well, and then this is back to that, with, like um, with that Sienkiewicz piece, page too, where with um, I don't know whatever that character's name with the weird face and the that looked like Warlock. he was using yeah, like that's a similar problem with that wash up in the top left. Like, do you make that all black? Do you leave some of the wash? Like, what do you what do you do there? Mm -hmm. And the cheek yeah. here, yeah, because you have these really dark marks over lighter marks, and that does that does communicate some extra level of depth that that turning into a black mess with a little bit of hatching sticking out doesn't communicate. Right. But of course, those aren't your only options. Uh, if you yeah. were doing this modern, you know, with, you know, you really know what you're doing with it and you've got the modern techniques available to you. You can make each of those dry brush things, you know, be broken up in a way that communicates it closer to the intent while also keeping a fidelity of, you know, one off, uh black on white printing and you this can go the, the nerdiest go thing on that. reproduction in, in a while <laughs> well they can go anyone who's watching this and hasn't watched the sharpening and then cleanup page that hasn't gone up yet yeah the sharpening it's gonna yeah. be totally i apologize for making the most <laughs> esoteric thing on youtube this, this is, is not so this was the, the this let me tell not, you those manga volumes are tough to scan because they do not they do not lie flat and i put right. the entire the big damn sin city volume on top of it and it's still <laughs> gutter so uh, i i just like to apologize in advance and say at least we're not like you know people talking about our watermelon head fetish or something like that you know <laughs> it's about the same <laughs> <laughs> except those people get sexual gratification out of it yeah. i don't get any i don't get any gratification talking about uh <laughs> no. issues. You get a little bit um this is so <laughs> awesome right here yeah that's really, really wild, man. I, I just love, I just, I, I'm so inspired by seeing the rendering. I'm inspired to do my own insane, uh, insane split brush work here. <laughs> Looking yeah. through this one is like, you're right though. It's like, um, just the way the, the immediacy to the drawing is so much, it, it's really kind of makes you want to go pick up and just yeah, through some pages. Go to it. Go forth. And and, and you uh, you scanned one of the ones that had the oh here it there is the go. red and the mm -hmm. blue, but this isn't the blue, which is that's no. really weird. Like I think that blue is just like oh I he just accidentally dipped in the wrong jar or something. No, I think the blue is is uh is uh, the gray wash on top of whiteout. Oh, um, so he whited out something underneath that right there. Uh, and that part remained yeah. white and the blue 
the gray just looked different over the whiteout. Yeah, oh. it, Sean, you're right because you can see there where it covers over the black mm -hmm. because it mm -hmm. like rewetted the whiteout a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Mm. God damn, you're a good forensic <laughs> eye. <laughs> As is gorgeous, absolutely yep. gorgeous. But the red's like, very intentional. They gave him color on that. Yeah, they yeah. gave him a second color uh, for that installment. But like even these page these pages with these backgrounds, like they look super detailed at a glance. But he he's really, you know, I I feel like he's wisely like deploying detail. Like he he. he does enough on that those roofs in the foreground to tell you the texture of the roofs in the background but then he doesn't have to do anything on on anything in the background really right yeah and no rulers or anything it's pop up no pop. yeah i i just i kind of i really i really love this this the the look that that he achieves on here i'd really like to see him uh, i'd be curious to know if he ever did any comics that don't involve people chopping each other's hands off um, <laughs> Is, did he did he when would he have had times to do anything else yeah. huh is this your other book you were talking about sean no so that right there uh is not by him that is was uh done in the early 80s this is a sequel to uh the fantastic kamui and this mm -hmm. is fine adventure comic but the original kamui is really something else you're not going to be able to no no you're not <laughs> you, you're not going to be able to <laughs> You're not going to be able to find it. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, uh, that has to be it. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let, let's let's uh... <laughs> let's. This might get become a dangerous uh, search. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I was saying fantastic Kamui. It's a, uh, no, the 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 legend of Kamui uh, from the early '60s is incredible absolutely incredible and then 20 years later there's like a semi-sequel that was print, uh published in english under the same name even though it had senpai shirato and his studio credited it was his brother drawing that one it looked pretty um, good the stylistic and, i mean there's yeah, similarities great. well it's 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 influenced by uh kojima uh so so it's like it's like visual it's like it's like an ouroboros you know uh so his brother ended up being the the artist on that series but he's influenced by the guy who was secretly the finished artist on the previous series that's pretty cool yeah um and and I, as far as i know might not ever make it into english at least until something changes um i know that that i it would that would be a dream of mine uh, for something like that to come out in english because it's yeah really spe something spectacular you imagine uh the finish of this artwork with a master flexible cartoonist doing the writing and um layout and uh, pencils and somebody who's like firing on all cylinders writing something that's that's horrific and funny and political and um you know fantastic while also sort of grounded in a certain some kind of economic reality that's <laughs> that's senpai shirado's uh you know so the real question sean is yeah if they'd let you, would you fly to fly to Japan with a scanner in in your suitcase? Uh -huh. <laughs> would you be crazy enough to scan all those? Oh, oh sure. Do I? I mean, do I have to do it myself? I mean, if you're going to scan, uh, if you're going to scan four thousand pages of something, you get you get four scanners working simultaneously. Uh, <laughs> I'll go. <laughs> I'll I go do. with. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go and. <laughs> Because someone needs to do these things justice. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's a. It, I I think people have to be convinced that there's a, there's money there. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. to be upended uh, as a one person uh, uh, who I've talked to about these types of things. So so delicately put it, Japanese publishers think that American publishers are a pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> we probably are. Probably not untrue. <laughs> like the. Uh, wow. You know, there it's a big industry, uh, and uh, you know the big industry is not necessarily in re in, in reprinting historic works that they already yeah. have serviceable uh, negatives for. But to yeah. me, like that's the stuff that's most interesting. You know, like the things that um, were really, really important to a large group of people at one time, and then they don't, don't get to see be seen anymore. You know, yeah. um, 
to me which is stuff, a shame yeah because you can see lone wolf and cubs impact on so many things still today and i mean even to all of the seminal comics that like american comics all have there's there's a clear impact of lone wolf and cub well i mean you could even uh you could argue that uh you wouldn't have the same kind of like you know rap groups and things that have used the films as influence are tremendous i mean mm-hmm. what's what's the name of the the group that has here, here's the part where i start talking about the, the wu-tang <laughs> yeah w- would you have uh wu-tang clan if it weren't for uh the uh three lone wolf and cub movies is that what they were i, I know nothing about wu-tang sorry. is isn't all of their uh all of their uh you know so, somebody's googling now uh, like the, <laughs> the rings of the shaolin yeah Mm-hmm. I don't Isn't know if that that's all a based... Wolf and Cub thing, but it's definitely influenced by those types of films. Uh, I, there's a whole mythology behind them that I'm not yeah. super up on. I'm I'm most interested in their their one off album that got bought by the Pharma Bro and <laughs> is now is like in uh, in U.S. government lockup because he's in jail. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't Shogun really Assassin. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Shogun Assassin was the uh, and that the, was the original like English language Lone Wolf and Cub, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. So a lot of a lot of cultural impact, and people are going to be ripping off that image of the soft and the hard together like that for a long a long time. And uh, you know, so on one hand, you think that Casio Koike had the ability to write those stories and the ability to see that image and know what he could what he could do with it. On the mm-hmm. other hand. He really lucked in, lucked out working with somebody like Kojima who could draw the way that he could. I mean, it's just a really quite wild <laughs> combination of uh, abilities there. Well, um, and I, I really yeah. appreciate being able to see these scans that you gave us, Matt, and see the artist edition. Because like I said, Lone Wolf and Cub is always something that's like, you know, it's like a legend legendary book but anytime i've looked at it i've always been like eh, eh, whatever and like now i get it but uh, it's impressive to me that people saw through all of that and still you know took something away from it because frank miller wasn't seeing probably really great reproductions of these things either so no and i mean you can tell based on his covers like i feel like the covers that frank miller did are all from like the first like first first or second volumes basically like i don't i wonder how much when he was doing the covers how much he was actually able to read at that point he was doing them for the monthly uh 48 pagers as they came out so he just did it you know he just did a burst of them at the very beginning those were actually uh, reorganized a little bit like the origin story is the first issue um so they pulled that out and stuck it at the beginning and then they stuck in a few other ones that sort of gave you the idea that there's going to be a continuing story uh, uh so um but yeah so that's why um all of the miller covers are the way that they are is because he um just did the first however many issues for the monthly publication um well uh thanks for coming and talking to us about this matt especially on your birthday so that means yeah. birthday boy <laughs> happy birthday to you Happy birthday to you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to Sean, you're the professional Happy here. birthday, yeah. dear Matt. Here's a comic about killing. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I, I, Thanks, as long man. as you don't invite him to sit in your lap, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't, but, yeah, we haven't even happy. talked about birthday boy spankings no. or yeah. offered him a ball and a sword and asked nope. him to pick which one. <laughs> no. Um, if you made it to the end of this video, uh, I'd like to praise you and your persistence. Um, <laughs> a lot of kvetching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, as, as is my want on occasion, if you make it to this part, uh, let me know in the comments. And the first person who does, I'll get him something in the mail. Um, really do appreciate you guys uh, listening, watching, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're going to do it again. So hopefully you'll be there. And if you want your own epic, uh, I would suggest picking up a copy of The Strange Death of Alex Raymond uh, at the moment that I am saying this, available for 20% off at the Living the Line store. Oh, these guys have their copies. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I see three go, copies, right? 
<laughs> Even Matt's camera has this copy. <laughs> yeah. You've got two copies, one for you and one for your camera. That's yeah. awesome. A little size comparison there. You can see that uh, we didn't we didn't uh, chintz on the size there. This is a you know a, a large and no chintzing on size. the reproduction either. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, so um, uh, anyway, uh, thank you very much, guys. And um, anybody else have anything to say or sing? Nope. No, definitely All not right. sing. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys. Make sure to like, smash that subscribe button, and ring that bell.